Wow, that was, uh, that was very uh, emotional, actually. And I even saw tears and looked like tears in her eyes, like she'd been crying before she began that song. Um, okay, so we are uh, just, just a little reminder, of course, that uh, in this year we are, uh, uh, for, for the whole year, we are doing the deep dive. And um, uh, so this is, this is the common theme uh, for both Unity Kitchener and Unity Ottawa. And that means that, uh, of course, we are um, having a speaker come and uh, um, really get an opportunity over three weeks to really delve deeply into a topic. And it uh, gives us a, a much, uh, an opportunity for a much greater understanding uh, of the topic at hand. And, and today's forgiveness is uh, certainly going to be something I think we're going to all uh, enjoy. And so I'm going to get right into that. I am going to uh, welcome once again, uh, Wendy Kerr. Um, and uh, this is the first of, of the three weeks that she's going to be with us. And uh, from what I uh, know of Wendy, I know that she is uh, a lifetime spiritual leader and teacher. Uh, and that she uh, is, a, is a licensed Unity teacher who, uh, uh, rather than being connected to any particular church, goes everywhere and everywhere, everywhere and anywhere that she is asked to come. She was telling me this morning when I talked to her, she's in, uh, you know, somewhere in Toronto in, uh, in the morning and in the afternoon, she's out on the West Coast. And uh, um, so she's uh, certainly a very valuable speaker um, for, for, for unity and speaking the truth of unity. Um, uh, let's see, I guess, uh, I guess that's all I'm going to say because I think I will let her uh, talk for herself. I really want everyone to give a very, very a uh, hearty welcome to our guest speaker today, Wendy Carr. Thank you, Lynn. It's so good to see all of you. I was reminiscing that the last time I spoke in Ottawa, I think was in 97. So this is, it's been a while and um, it's nice to see familiar faces and great to see some new ones. So I will begin uh, by acknowledging that I am, I am uh, streaming from uh, land of the Mississauga, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Attawandaran, the Anishinaabe, Waki, sorry, and the uh, Haudenosaunee. I am still learning how to correctly pronounce these, but I honor that I am a white settler on land that is not mine. So for the next three weeks, um, many of you already know because we've been using it in the book study, I am going to be speaking on uh, the Tutus, the Book of Forgiving. And I have a couple questions for you. Feel free to put a, a, a response or in the chat or uh, use a thumbs up in the, in the uh, uh, React uh, screen. Does any of this sound familiar to you? I have to say I forgave someone to be a good person. I have to say, I forgive you, not because I believe in it, but because it will make the situation de-escalate. I have been in situations where I felt that forgiveness was used as a weapon to exact a desired behavior. And as I was uh, thinking back about this, I've been uh, engaged with this book now for three years. Uh, and shout out to Cheryl uh, Rogers, because she had asked me to come to Kitchener and speak about restorative judge, uh, justice. And as I was preparing that, I found uh, references back to this book over and over and over again. And I got curious enough to go out and buy a copy and it has been an influence on me in the last three years um, as I've had lots of time to uh, work on forgiveness and other spiritual things while being in lockdown. So it's been a, a real blessing. I am so grateful to the Tutus uh, for sharing this path with us. If you've read the book or if you've looked at the book, you'll know that there are some difficult passages in this. And I invite you to go through them as you can. Um, 
because it's so important to understand that if we can forgive the big things, then forgiving little things becomes much easier. And I think that was, that was something that, that really resonated with me. So as Lynn mentioned, um, uh, Bishop Tutu was part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. How do we describe apartheid? Um, if I was being very polite and very tactful, I would say it was undesirable for the majority. Others would say that it was outright evil, and I would not dispute that assessment. So what follows today and in the next two weeks is an overview. It is by no means a exhaustive commentary or guidance through the book. <clears throat> um, but I have found this book has been very helpful for me getting through some of the forgiveness work that other areas have, have failed to do. Um, and I think it's because they do something that I've never seen before. And in the very beginning, it says, please go out and find a stone that appeals to you on some level. It can be beautiful or ugly. It shouldn't be a pebble, nor should it be a boulder. Find a stone with some weight to it. It should be small enough to carry in the palm of your hand and large enough that you won't lose it. Note in your journal exactly where you found the stole stone and what it was about the stone that appealed to you. And when I read that, I went, okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, confession time. I don't like journaling. I, I, there's something about journaling that just, I, it, it, it's not my favorite tool to use. Um, if I journal, I tend to use my non-dominant hand. Maybe that's the part of the resistance. Um, but I find it really hard to keep my brain and my hand in the same gear. And invariably, I end up with some things that I cannot read later or that make no sense if I go back a couple of years later and say, what the heck was I talking about there? I don't, I don't remember. So the idea of having this be a tactile exercise not just a thinking, but truly get into a, a sense of wholeness with, with the feeling and the thinking and the, the tactile sense part of our consciousness. I'm a head person. So a lot of my forgiveness work has been very head centered. And to bring myself into my body and acknowledge that we know that forgiveness work has a physical aspect to it in terms of what it can do for our bodies. So one of the things that uh, the Tutus point out is that revenge is often our preferred response to being hurt. But they point out that it's a closed circuit. You have hurt or harm or loss, which creates pain, which you have a choice at the next point here. You can choose to harm or you can choose to heal. If you choose to harm, which seems to be the default, uh, for many humans, no blame or shame, just a statement of what is. We reject our shared humanity. We get into a space of the other, what the other did to us, what the other caused us to feel, how the other has harm, harmed us. Then we get into things like revenge, retaliation, payback. It's like it's a ledger that has to be equal at all times. Then we get into violence and cruelty. Um, the, the story that the Tutus share about their housekeeper is particularly violent. It was difficult to read. I'm glad I did um, because I can come to an amazing awareness of the depth of their empathy and their understanding of how forgiveness works. And of course, violence and cruelty by its very nature leads to more hurt, harm, loss, pain, and so on and so on. But we can make that conscious choice instead to heal. And this is what the tutus call the fourfold path. So making that conscious choice to heal. And it, it needs to be a conscious choice. It needs to be something where your mind and your heart are in unity saying, yes, this is what we'll do. Because if you want to just heal from and, and forgive from your heart, that's fine. But I can tell from personal experience that your head is going to be telling you, 
yeah, but what about, and what about, and what about, and remember, and remember that other time, the brain will, will not agree if it's not invited to be part of the process. And by the same token, if you do it solely out of your head, your heart will say, hey, wait a minute, what about me? What about all the broken pieces that I'm experiencing? So it has to be that unity of our head and our heart, our thinking, our feeling, and our willingness to allow the story to change, that we're willing to allow that which no longer serves to be released from our memories, released from our bodily cells, released from the heart that has been hurting. So the way we do the fourfold cycle, the first thing we do, and we will actually do the fourfold next week, we're just going to do the, the beginning stages today, just getting into that, because I've always found it challenging to forgive, uh, in part because of all those questions at the beginning. Forgiveness didn't always work for me growing up. But first we tell the story. Then we name the hurt. That can be a difficult process. Having the in our culture, uh, a societal norm that you don't say when someone hurt you necessarily, especially if it's a close family member or friend or someone you trusted, that we, you know, that process of naming the hurt can be very challenging. Granting forgiveness, which they define as recognizing our shared humanity, getting back into that space where the other becomes part of the oneness. It doesn't mean that you have to welcome them back into your, your life, but that that part of you is left in the past where it belongs and you move forward with the blessings and the gifts of the experience. And then finally, renewing or releasing the relationship. You notice a difference here? It's not a circle. It's a pathway. Now, I've got it a little too straight because if I, if I had drawn it the way I experienced it, it would be all over the map in chaos. And that's perfectly fine because it doesn't have to be a straight line. It can be uh, however long it takes, whatever form it takes. The idea though is to break that cycle of violence and cruelty and to bring us into the oneness that we truly are and to move into that space. And the best part is we can choose to loop back any time and start the path over with another situation or another person or another relationship or another concern of the world. So this is a pathway for us. And I called this the stone, the path of the stone because in each of the chapters, there is an activity involving your stone. And truth be told, I don't have my stone with me. My stone is out in the garden getting some sunshine. So my first question, of course, is why forgive? The tutus point out forgiveness is beneficial to our health. Well, there's a thought right there. Forgiveness offers freedom from the past, from a perpetrator, from future victimizations. Forgiveness feel, heals families and communities. We forgive so we don't suffer physically or mentally the corrosive effects of holding on to anger and resentment. We are all interconnected and have a shared community and a shared humanity. And forgiveness is a gift we give ourselves. Now, the key here is, though, you forgive when you are ready to. Not when society says you should be ready. Rather, when that still small voice within you says, I'm ready to start. And you move through the stages, not at a, fr a frantic pace to get it over with because it can be painful, but rather mindfully with each step, looking within to the still small voice that says, yes, I'm complete. What's our next step? And of course, we know that forgiveness is also known as convincing myself to make time for this, to engage in it honestly, and to ignore anything which would keep me from completing the path. It's an investment. I have been very mindful of the phrase spending time and changing it to investing time. So I invite you to invest time in forgiveness work. So the first stone exercise is to 
hold it for one morning, approximately six hours plus minus, in your non-dominant hand, at least they give us that, and don't set the stone down. And then they have a journaling exercise to, for us to carry. And this is around choosing to heal. What I discovered when I did this exercise the first time, I had just come out of a rather traumatic situation and I was still angry. I was still hurt. I was still trying to find my feet again. And I realized that I was carrying that stone. And let me tell you, there are some things in life that are very difficult to do one-handed. And I bless and appreciate and honor anyone who does that one-handed because they physically have lost the capacity for two hands or they are missing part of their limb. Because I learned so much about how much I assume I have two hands. But at the end of those hours, I said, yes, I'm, I'm tired of carrying this stone around. I'm carrying, tired of carrying this burden around. I am ready to release and let it go. I still have some work to do on it. It was something that required a lot of attention and careful gentleness as I've worked through it. So the journal exercise, what did you notice about carrying the stone? When did you notice it the most? There were a couple of specific tasks that one does on a daily basis that are challenging one-handed. Was it ever useful? In what ways was carrying the stone like carrying an unforgiven hurt? And then finally, a list of the people you need to forgive in your life and the list of those who would like you to, to forgive you for hurts known and unknown. So it is a very mindful situation to go and work sincerely on forgiveness. I think as a child uh, in my church of origin, it was like, well, you had to say it, that you were sorry and then everybody was fine. And there was no dealing with the outcome. There was no addressing the, the harm that it had done, the hurt that it had done, the pain that it was caused. It was just say you're sorry and continue where you were. Um, that hasn't worked well for me, especially as I've gotten older and, and realized the harm that that actually did. Tutus give a, a summary about what forgiveness is not. And I think this is really important because a lot of what they said here as I was reading it the first time, I said, oh yeah. When I read it through the second time, I went, oh yeah. And now the third time I'm like, yeah, this is what it's about. It's not easy. It requires hard work and a consistent willingness. And I don't, I don't really like the phrase hard work, but I don't have, know how to change those words because it is hard and it is work in that it's not something I want to sit down and do necessarily. But by the time in the past, I'm getting better with it, with practice. In the past, it was like I was in such physical, emotional, and spiritual pain that my choices were forgiveness or except that I would be in pain forever. So that's where the hardness comes in. And it's work because we're not taught these things. We're taught societal norms, which doesn't usually include deep healing work. Forgiveness is not a weakness. It requires courage and strength. Forgiveness does not subvert justice. It creates space for justice to be enacted with a purity of purpose that does not include revenge. Uh, and, and they go in at some depth about how to get into this space of justice. Forgiveness is not forgetting. It requires a fearless remembering of hurt. Remember the time that when I first got on a ha around the trauma I had come out of and realizing that without that trauma, I would still be stuck in a position that I literally was stuck in. That instead, that was the, the, the tow truck that pulled me out of a position that I was unhappy in, that was toxic to me, and created the space for me to do things like Sunday talks and teaching classes. Forgiveness is not quick. 
It can take several journeys through the cycles of remembering and, for, and grief before one can truly forgive and be free. I think this was when I sort of said, yeah, okay, I'm willing to, to give you guys a try and give your, your plan a try. Because what I learned was that growing up, as I said, you know, you had to say you were sorry. And then if you still felt that hurt, if you still felt that harm, if you still felt that pain, you were further victimized because you obviously didn't mean it at, at your apology. And so your forgiveness didn't count. And somehow we were victimizing, you know, it, the, the, the whole situation even further. So whatever hurt was in place from the event situations that I felt hurt, harmed by, doubly, if you're still hurting, it's your own damn fault because you didn't do it right. I mean, how, how uh, it, does anyone else have that experience? Or maybe it was unique to me, but I've had that on occasion. In, in fact, there was a, a work uh, situation where I, I was called in with my union rep and told I had to apologize to a colleague for something that she actually did to me, but the way she told the story, I had been the perpetrator. And it was, it was so uncomfortable. And I realized that it was so um, challenging because there was no forgiveness work. It was like, okay, you two work together. Well, you can imagine what that was like working with that person for the next while. I think I'm almost over that one. But as you can probably tell, there was a lot of betrayal. There was a lot of things that were done less than, than professionally at that place of work. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a term which is not in the book, but I need to tell you what it is so that when I use it next week, you'll know. It's called metaphysical dust bunnies. Metaphysical dust bunnies are things that pop up in your consciousness after you've done the forgiveness work and you realize you missed a spot. You think you're all over something, and then you hear a song, you taste some food. That was a weird one for me. I, I had a bite of something, and I suddenly was instantly back in the situation, being reminded of a portion of that situation that I was still hanging on to and had not forgiven. But something that triggers you, and you suddenly realize that there are still more work to be done. There are still more dust bunnies to be cleaned out of your brain, out of your heart, out of your body, out of your consciousness. So next week, we will talk about metaphysical dust bunnies at some greater length. And if you're wondering, how do you clean metaphysical dust bunnies? You can use the techniques in this book, or my personal favorite prior to this book was the unity technique of denials and affirmations. More on that next week. So continuing the journey with the stone, and this is why I, I so have loved this book and I, I'm passionate about it and I recommend it to everybody. Tracing the myths. So he suggests that an, in, there's an instance where there's a myth that's holding you back from granting forgiveness. Now you're actually instructed to draw, to trace your stone five times. And then write in these words that and these are the five things that forgiveness is not. So what is the myth around this? Well, one of the myths that I grew up with was that it was easy. You just say you're sorry, you won't do it again, and all's, all's well and good and, and everything will be fine. That has not been my experience in this life. Forgetting. I choose not to forget some of the aspects of what I've been through because I recognize the blessing of how they have shaped who I am today. And there are things that I'm not going to forget because I'm still engaged with the person that was part of that. I have forgiven the hurt. I have let go of my attachment to the event, but I am not going to forget that person because they're still part of me. We had a bump. So they say it's water under the bridge now that I've done the work of purifying the water. Another ritual that's suggested is marking the path. And as you can see, take your stone and trace around it four times in your journal, creating the four steps of the fourfold path. And then to sit and contemplate and meditate on what's holding you back. 
What resistance are you feeling? I don't want to tell that story. It's embarrassing because I wasn't exactly completely innocent of the situation either. It was, it was both of us involved. Naming the hurt. I don't want to feel those emotions. I've got them stuffed down really good and tight. And I don't want to, to feel that pain again. It's fine where it is stuffed in a corner, pushed down in a darkness where I can't see it. But we all know that we still feel it. Granting forgiveness. Why on earth would I grant them forgiveness? Why, why would I do that? And finally, release, renew or release. You know, there's something about having that pain, that hurt. There is something in our culture, or at least mine, where it's a badge of honor to carry your hurts with a stiff upper lip, with that sense of I'm better than this. And to let go of, or uh, especially letting go of, you suddenly lose all of that energy around poor me. And sometimes that can be hard. As I forgive, I know the fullness of divine love. And let us take this thought into our time of meditation. And I'll just invite you to get comfortable. I usually give a little bit of a twist of my neck, my shoulders, and a little bit of a wiggle. Because I recognize that my body is a part of me. My body is not fully me, but it's a significant part. And that if I don't acknowledge my body before I meditate, it twitches or it gets itchy or it demands attention somehow. So please just take a couple seconds. And as you're ready, if you wish to close your eyes, if that's comfortable, please do so. There'll be some artwork on the screen that you can look at if you choose not to. And just taking a few deep breaths, I invite you to go to the space in your body where you feel that connection. Ah, where you feel that sense of divinity, that true self that you are, that true self that does not harm, does not hurt, that only loves. And heart to heart, hand to hand, soul to soul, we come into this place of oneness opening ourselves to the possibility of healing, of willingness to take the four steps. To allow ourselves permission to be who we authentically are. To state the hurts, to acknowledge them, to forgive ourselves first and foremost for any attachment we may have kept. Acknowledging that we are a mass, not only of our divine self, but of the ideas that have been presented to us as we've grown up. Cultural norms, societal norms, family norms education norms, things that intuitively we might not have agreed with, but we persevered because we wanted to be part of the community. And now we are aware of a different path, a path of integrity and authenticity, a path that allows us to shed the layers of pain, of harm, of hurt, and move into a deeper space of light and love. And as we move through this series together, we acknowledge each other and say, well done for choosing to make this next best step for ourselves. We join in heart and hand and soul, supporting each other, acknowledging that we may need some space to process, 
or we may need to reach out for support. And in this awareness of love, in this awareness of beauty, in the awareness of what is, we hold in light and love this planet and everything on it. We extend our love to all in whatever form it needs to take. Perhaps it needs to be a healing of a relationship a healing of a prosperity issue, an awareness of the oneness that we truly are, that we are working towards, that as each of us becomes a greater beacon of light, we can only help to heal and prosper this world as the light grows and expands. And let us now in this time, take into mind all the names in the chat, all the names on our hearts, surrounding everyone with light and love, knowing that they are being given the guidance for their next best step, for healing, for relationships, for ed employment and education, for being the best be me that they can be. And in this Pride Month, we give thanks for those who have gone before. We acknowledge that some are not yet ready to come out of the closet, and that is okay. We rejoice with those who have found a life path that works for them openly, and that's wonderful too. And we just accept that for some, this is their biggest healing journey. Knowing that we are all one, regardless of how we look, regardless of who we love, regardless of our lifestyle, regardless of where we work, regardless of our economic status, regardless of everything that humanly exists, we are one. And so it is, and so it shall be. Amen. Oh,